Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this very special and unique installation service. To the members of the Methodist Church in Ireland, and to all of you joining in this service this evening, who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your Lord and ours, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. In normal circumstances, the first act of the representative session of our annual conference is to install in the context of a service of worship the incoming president of our church, and when the occasion demands it, the new lay leader of our church. It is always a very formal, special, and memorable occasion. This year, because of the coronavirus restrictions, we've had to postpone our representative session but our meeting under the authority of our constitution as directed by our general committee and have arranged this unique gathering in this unique way in order to ensure that our incoming president and our new lay leader are suitably recognized, installed and welcomed. Please God, later in the year, we hope to complete and celebrate in our usual way what we are initiating and rejoicing in this evening. Our lay leader and myself, together with the Secretary of Conference, are here in the Assembly Buildings in Belfast to conduct this service. We are grateful as a connection to the Presbyterian Church in Ireland for facilitating not only this occasion, but also the rehearsal for it on Monday. And we are especially grateful to the technicians here in the building and from our own church who are enabling the live streaming. Those of you on these shores and around the world are, we hope, enjoying Indeed, we're glad to be able to hold this service at all. The current level of restriction allows it to take place, and as you will see, we are observing social distancing as required. It is usual in our installation services that we have special guests and that we welcome them. This evening, they're here by courtesy of a Zoom wall, and I'd like to introduce them and to welcome them by doing so. They are firstly the representatives from our sister church in Britain, the Reverend Dr. Barbara Glasson, President of the Methodist Church in Britain, and Professor Clive Marsh, Vice President of the Methodist Church in Britain. Then we have clergy from our sister churches here in Ireland, the Right Reverend Dr. William Henry, the immediate past moderator of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, the Very Reverend Michael Burroughs, Bishop of Cashel, Ferns and Ossery, and Co-Chair of the Covenant Council. The Most Reverend Brendan Leahy, Bishop of Limerick and Co-Chair of the Irish Interchurch Meeting. And the Right Reverend Dr. Ivan Patterson, President of the Irish Council of Churches. We're delighted also to have clergy with us from the three sister churches, with which our three districts have formed partnerships. The Reverend Dr. Paul Boafo, the presiding bishop of the Methodist Church in Ghana. The Reverend Slamovir Rodosinski, a district superintendent of the United Methodist Church, Poland. The Reverend Angela Wilson-Dogbe, representing the president of the Methodist Church in Togo. And from our own church, we have our district superintendents, Andrew Doherty, Dr. Stephen Skuse, and Philip Agnew. Our lay district leaders, Julie Hines, Ruth Matthews, David Best, and Tom Wilson. Laura Griffith and John Clark are supporting our lay leader designate. And the Reverends Roy Cooper and Billy Davison are supporting our president designate. And last, but by no means least, we have Rachel Galt and Christopher Loney, our lady leader designate's daughter and son. 
There are some not on the Zoom wall for various reasons, but whom we'd like to make special mention of at this point. They are the Reverend Bobby Loney, our lay leader designate's husband, and Mrs. Elizabeth McKnight, our president designate's wife, and their daughters, Beth and Catherine. Welcome to all of you, especially those of you from sister churches. Thank you for your willingness to join us in this uh, singular way this evening. And thank you for gracing this service with your presence in this virtual way. It is very comforting and encouraging to those of us who are physically here uh, to have you with us and to see your smiling faces on the screen before us in this special way. The main people tonight and the main focus of our attention in this special service are the Reverend Dr. Tom McKnight, our president designate, and Mrs. Hazel Loney, our lay leader designate. We welcome you both and all those members of your family circles in far-flung places who are only able to join you by electronic means tonight, but who are with you in spirit here this evening on this distinctive and defining occasion for you both. A year ago, none of us could have envisaged your installation taking this form. Three months ago, all of us were anxious as to whether we could hold this service at all. But here we are, much to the relief of the Secretary of Conference, much to the delight of Linda Neelans and myself, and much to the joy of our whole church. Now, as we acknowledge that we are in the presence of God, and as we seek his blessing, let us pray. Lord, you are more gracious than we can imagine. You are more holy than we will ever grasp. You have a majesty that leaves us breathless. You are almighty in ways beyond our comprehension. You are loving beyond our expectations. You require us to act justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly in ways that challenge us. You demand that our lives and our lifestyle always bring you honor and glory. You alone are our Savior, our Lord and Master, and there is no other. We are in awe of your extravagant love, your life-transforming grace, your holiness, and the utter perfection of all that you are and everything you do. Lord, you're completely out of our reach. There's nowhere we can go to find you, yet in your love you seek us out. There is nothing we can say or do or accomplish that will make us worthy of your love, yet by grace you save us. There is nothing about our lives or our achievements, nothing about our commitment, worship, or service that makes us more acceptable, yet you are merciful to us. Lord, you exceed our greatest thought. You're beyond our deepest meditation. You completely overwhelm us with the utter and absolute integrity of your love, the sufficiency of your grace and the extent of your mercy. You've come to us in Christ and we're thankful to know the efficacy of his crucifixion and resurrection. You've gifted us the Holy Spirit and we're grateful to experience daily his life-changing, life-enhancing and life-empowering presence. We are assured that you are our God and that we are loved and that in grace, mercy and love you will go on holding our lives, filling us with joy and giving us hope. And yet, Father God, we're only too aware that we're not the people you meant us to be. We're not living the kind of lives you created us to live, nor even the kind of lives you recreated us to live. And our words and thoughts and deeds as individuals and as a church are not bringing you glory to the extent we would like. Forgive us, Father, for the way that through our plans and dreams and choices, we hurt each other, we damage your world, we impede your church and frustrate the growth of your kingdom, and we constantly rebuild barriers between ourselves and you and between one another. We humbly ask that you will not only forgive us, but that you will also cleanse and renew us. Lord, everything good that we have and are as individuals and as a church is a gift from you. We've earned nothing for which you did not give us the skills. We've achieved nothing for which you did not give us the time and the energy. We possess nothing for which we do not owe you grateful thanks and praise. 
And so in this, our amended annual conference service, meeting as we are in this unique way, we pray that you accept our offering of praise and thanksgiving, that you lay your hand of blessing upon those whom we install to the highest offices in our church, that you encourage us all in the purpose for which you've called us, that you unite us in faith and fellowship, and that through us, now and always, you bless your world. All this we pray for your name's sake and glory, and continue our prayer in the words our Savior taught as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Conference wouldn't be conference without the inclusion of this great hymn. This afternoon at our ministerial session, we felt again its poignancy and power. I pray we do so again now as we sing, And Are We Yet Alive? Mr. President, Madam Lay Leader, the Methodist Conference, when it met in Cork in June 2019, designated Hazel Loney as Lay Leader of the Conference from June 2020. The Manual of Laws provides that in emergency situations and on the advice of the President's Advisory Committee, that the General Committee may act as conference. Acting in that capacity, the General Committee, working by email in March 2020, unanimously ratified the appointment, giving permission for the installation to go ahead.
We delight that God has called you to this role. Who is supporting you? John Clark and Laura Griffith. Let us pray. God of grace, in Christ you have given yourself for the church and have entrusted all your people with the message of your salvation for the whole world. We pray for the one now called to be lay leader of this conference. Grant her your strength and wisdom, your love and power, that she may lead and guide us according to your will and ever hold before us the vision of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be glory in the church throughout all ages. Amen. We proclaim Christ crucified, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Our scripture reading this evening will be read for us by our daughter, Rachel. The reading is taken from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20, the Great Commission. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told the disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Mr. President and a past lay leader, now um, members of conference and all our esteemed guests, it was no small surprise to me last year when we attended our 250th conference in Cork to find myself nominated and then appointed by the conference as the lay leader designate. And of course that role begins today. Before I respond to that, however, I want to pay a warm tribute to Mrs. Linda Neelands, my predecessor who has been an amazing lay leader, bringing her particular gifts and creativity to this role. Linda, you have been a faithful and good lay leader, and I know that you will go on to do other equally creative and imaginative things. Actually, just last night uh, in our cell group over in Craigmore, we were using your resources for Bible study, and we enjoyed them immensely. You have been a great encouragement to many people across the connection and in the many committees that you have been involved in. And then over the last year, you have been a great encouragement to me. So I want to express the heartfelt thanks of us all. You know, usually at a time like this, people say things like, well, these are very big shoes to fill. But Linda, I can't say that because your shoes are really dainty. But your footprints are deep and lasting. Now, my response to uh, being appointed to this role this evening is twofold. I consider this a responsibility as well as a great honor to serve the Methodist Church in Ireland in this way. More than that, I receive this as a great commission, a commission from the governing body of MCI, but also a great commission from Christ himself. Of all the post-resurrection appearances, the one that really catches my imagination and arrests my attention is the one that Rachel read for us just now from the very closing verses of Matthew's Gospel. When the risen Christ spoke to the woman at the tomb, 
he told them to tell the disciples that he was going ahead of them into Galilee. There they will see me. In 2018, Bobby and I joined with a group of friends from all over our connection here in Ireland to, to make a trip to Israel. Now, seven days tearing around this incredible land is breathtaking and exhilarating, but it's over in a flash. However, in the days and weeks and months after that, as I read the scriptures and prepared to preach or lead Bible studies, in my imagination, I revisited many of these locations. And one of them was, of course, the beautiful Sea of Galilee, a place where much of the gospel story took place. And we're not, of course, very sure where this incident took place, but we know it was on a mountain in Galilee. Now, mountains are significant in the story of redemption, and ever since Sinai, such vantage points have been places of revelation and clarity and, and a looking to the future. And in Matthew's gospel, we have been on the Mount of uh, Temptation. We've been on the Sermon on the Mount. We've been on the Mount of Transfiguration. We've been at the great Olivet Discourse, and now in this place, the Mount of Commission. Matthew tells us that the eleven went to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. Now, we don't get a description, a physical description of Jesus and his resurrection body or the glory of that or anything like that. But for these eleven Jewish men, he was worthy of worship. But it's what he says it's the verbal revelation that's the core of this encounter. Matthew tells us he came to them. And even though some doubted, he said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Here is Jesus' final self claim in the gospel. You know, I come from the heart of rural County Armagh, and I know all right that some of my older relatives would describe that uh, in the local lingo as a big speck. And so it is. All authority in heaven and on earth. This sends our minds racing back across the pages of the Old Testament right back to Genesis, referring to every part of creation. But we hear Daniel speaking from exile in Babylon of his great vision, one like a son of man who was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom one that will never be destroyed." My mind tumbles forward into the New Testament, and I hear the Apostle Paul describing him to the church at Colossae in that great hymn about the superiority of Christ. By him all things were created, things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him, and in him all things hold together. And writing to the church at Philippi, he could tell them that one day every knee would bow in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Or the writer to the Hebrews in the opening lines of that amazing letter speaking of the Son whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the universe. He is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Or the risen glorified Christ who spoke to John on Patmos as the one who was dead but who is alive forevermore and who holds the keys of death and Hades. This is the one who speaks here on this mountain. This is not the Jesus of our Sunday school coloring in pages or the pale Galilean from an artist's imagination, but it is a cosmic Christ, 
the one to whom all authority has been given. You know, when Bobby and I were much younger, and there is photographic evidence that we were younger one time, and uh, there was a particular Bible teacher who always fed our souls. And he used to say to us, when you're studying Scripture and you come across a therefore, you need to find out what it's there for. And this therefore in this account is in the light of not the authority offered by the devil on another mountain, but all authority in heaven and earth that was achieved through the cross and the resurrection. So these 11 very average men were to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the strong name of the Trinity and teaching them to obey everything he had commanded to the nation. This brings to fruition that incredible promise way back in Genesis 12 when God called Abraham and told him that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. This gospel was going to the world. How preposterous this sounds. And I have visited in my imagination this scene many times. And it probably wasn't a very impressive sight that these average bunch of disciples on this mountain overlooking Galilee were told to go not just to their own people or their own locality, but the nations. And they did. And we are here this evening because of that. The great promise comes at the end. This happened and this will happen and this goes on happening because of the enabling presence of the risen Christ whose power and authority we have been talking about. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So there will be an end of the age, the summing up of history. This hasn't happened yet. So the commission is still ours. This great claim presented these disciples and us with a final decision, even in the midst of honest doubt, to obey this great commission. When we know who God is and who Jesus is, witnessing mission is the unavoidable outcome. I'm quoting here, I read this in a book I read some time ago, uh, and I don't know who wrote it, but... I'm quoting, it is not so much the case that God has a mission for his church in the world as that God has a church for his mission in the world. Mission was not made for the church. The church was made for mission, God's mission. And that is why I take this great commission so seriously and why my strapline or theme for the next two years is three simple words, in Christ alone. For he stands at the center of God's purposes for the whole creation and through the church, which is his body, he still lives and moves amongst men. And so in these strange and difficult days that our president has already made reference to, I depend on the prayers of our connection from the south to the north, from the west to the east, that I will be faithful in all the business of the church that this role requires, that God by his spirit would instruct my tongue wherever I speak for him, that I will be attentive to the voices of lay people in our churches across the island and for wisdom in carrying out this task. We come now to the installation of Reverend Dr. Thomas R. McKnight as President of the Methodist Church in Ireland. Mr. President, Madam Lay Leader, the Methodist Conference, when it met in Cork in June 2019, designated Reverend Dr. Thomas R. McKnight as President of the Conference from June 2020. 
the Manual of Laws provides that in emergency situations and on the advice of the President's Advisory Committee, that the General Committee may act as conference. Acting in that capacity, the General Committee working by email in March 2020 unanimously ratified the appointment, giving permission for the installation to go ahead. Our scripture reading from John's Gospel will be read by Mr. Monty McKnight, brother of the President-designate. John 21, verses 15 through 17. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. President-designate, which of the former presidents are formally supporting you? Roy Cooper and Billy Davison. As we install the president, we pray. Almighty God, giver of all good things, by the Holy Spirit you have appointed different offices in your church. Send your Holy Spirit upon this your servant, now called to be, and in time to be consecrated as an Episcopal minister, in the office and ministry of the President of the Methodist Church in Ireland. So fill him with grace and the truth of your doctrine that both by word and deed he may faithfully serve you in this office and use the authority given to him to the glory of your name and the encouragement of your church through the merits of our Saviour Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit world without end. Amen. Mr. President, the Lord clothe you with the Holy Spirit for the office and work now committed to you by the authority of the church. Mr. President, think on the things contained in this book. Be guided by its truth that through his word there may be increase in God's kingdom. Amen. Amen.
Mr. Ex-President, Madam Lay Leader, honored guests on the Zoom wall, and those joining online, including my friends and family in Dallas. I first heard the hymn just played on Tuesday, the 26th of May, 1987, when I was ordained an elder in the United Methodist Church. It was written by United Methodist Bishop Gerald H. Kennedy and reminds us that we should respond to God's call regardless of the situation around us, regardless of the hour in which we live. For God has called us to this very hour. Listen again to the words of the first verse. God of love and God of power, grant us in this burning hour grace to ask these gifts of thee, daring hearts and spirits free. God of love and God of power, thou hast called us for this hour. And grace is the theme I have chosen for my presidential year, specifically grace without limits. And in October at the service of consecration, I hope to spell out more fully what I feel this means. But now I want to express thanks and appreciation to the ex-president, Reverend Sam McGuffin, for the way he with his wife Linda have led and served the connection over the past year. I am absolutely sure that when he chose the theme, God is our adventure, he did not have any idea what an adventure it would actually turn out to be. And I want to thank the outgoing lay leader, Linda Neelands, with whom I enjoyed a close working relationship during my time as secretary of the conference. She has been superb in the role, and I appreciated working with her. I also want to thank her for her many years as editor of the Methodist Newsletter, a position uh, from which I believe she has only recently retired. My robes were an ordination gift from my late parents, and my presidential stole was a gift from both Donaghadee Methodist Church and Donaghadee Parish Church of Ireland. And the, the symbol on my right, your left, is the cross and flame of the United Methodist Church, where my roots lie. And on the other is the orb and cross symbol of British and Irish Methodism. And the water motif underneath represents both the Atlantic Ocean, which I had to cross to get from one to the other, and also the seaside town of Donegadee, where we now live and where we plan to retire at the end of my presidential year, much to my wife's delight. In 1966, Senator Robert F. Kennedy, brother of the then fairly recently assassinated president, said in a speech, that there is an ancient curse which says, may you live in interesting times. And Kennedy went on to say, like it or not, we live in interesting times. They are times of danger and uncertainty, but they are also the most creative of any time in the history of mankind. One of my daughters, and for purposes of anonymity, I'm not saying which one, but it is my daughter, Beth, uh, remind, recently asked me, is this what it felt like during the war? Can I tell future generations what it was like in my day? Now, as she well knows, I wasn't around during the Second World War, but I do know what she means. I doubt that our church... I doubt that society will ever be the same again. Many have lost loved ones due to coronavirus, and we offer our prayer and sympathy to them as we continue to pray for those recovering. COVID-19 should teach us that to meet together, we don't always need to travel with the time, expense, and harm to the environment that entails. And the protests following the heart-rending death of George Floyd should remind us that we must not limit our understanding of God's grace to those like ourselves. And that, as has so often been repeated, black lives matter. 
After my theme, Grace Without Limits, was mentioned in the profile of me in this month's newsletter, a Methodist newsletter, I had an email from a colleague who reminded me of a poem often sung as a hymn entitled, He Giveth More Grace. It was written by Annie Johnson Flint, whose hard life straddled the beginning of the last century. Its words are powerful, despite, unfortunately, using the non-inclusive language of that era. And I finish these brief remarks with some of the words of that hymn. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your unlimited grace. We bring before you the year ahead with all its perplexities and uncertainties, both for our church and for the world. We pray for those who are troubled by the situation of the world around them, those suffering from depression made worse because of the difficulties of lockdown, those suffering from a cough or fever who fear they have contracted COVID-19 but are afraid to ask for a test in case it proves to be true. Those with weakened immune systems. Those serving in the health sector. We pray for those who are seeking true justice and fairness in the world. Justice that doesn't hinge on race or creed or how you have made them. We pray for this church, the Methodist Church in Ireland, as we strive to learn what you have to teach us during this continuing crisis, as we struggle to see how things will ever return to normal and what that normal should be. And we pray for this island as we face the uncertainties caused by Brexit, Guide us into the future, we pray, as we rest and hope in you. For we know that your love has no limits, and your grace has no measure. May we know and share your unlimited grace. In Jesus' name, amen.
The Lord met the light of his face, and the goodness of his heart to be brecht upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Niech się Pan błogosławi i strzeże. Paka se lumineze faca lui peste te. Choneka. Jehova, ty domu kam ninda melu jarti. Neneka samad. Kosi fuini alafia. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen. <laughs>